What if you actually got more, more than you could actually imagine with your conscious intention, your conscious control, your conscious awareness, your conscious mind? Maybe not what you thought you were going to get, but what if you got more and what if the more was actually better beyond what you could even imagine? Because many times we are projecting goals, dreams, desires based on our conscious logic, conscious awareness, which is based on our conditioning, which is based on our past, which is based on our current capacity and lens to perceive and see. And so we don't realize in so many ways that we are limiting life. And so part of surrender is to take the limitations off of life. So in terms of surrender, surrender is a letting go of control, or I should say the idea or the illusion that we are in control, because in so many ways, we may not be as in control as we have thought we were. You're listening to the Real Business Connections Network. Real Business Connections Network. Powered, powered, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. Subscribe now and check us out at realbusinessconnections.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome, everyone, to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. If you love to learn, be inspired, and succeed, we're here to speak and teach. I'm your host, Ben Albert. I believe if you're not living, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're withering. And if you're not engaged, we can turn this off right now. Because we here at LST are lifelong learners. And listen, I'm not your guru. I'm an ordinary guy on a journey to learn from the experts. My goal is to host each conversation with a beginner's mindset. Learn and let the experts speak and teach their truths. Join us. Oh yeah, and don't forget to subscribe. This episode is brought to you completely free. Get some stake in the game here. My fee for the show only takes a few moments. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Bonus points. Please leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, once again to Learn, Speak, Teach on the Real Business Connections Network. I'm here today with Cute Blackson. Cute, how are you? Blessed to be with you today. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Cute is the author of a couple national best-selling books. You are the one in his latest book, The Magic of Surrender. He is widely considered the next generation leader in the field of personal development, working with leaders ranging from Larry King, Jack Canfield, Marianne Williamson, and more. He has been featured on Larry King Now, Fox and Friends, Dr. Drew, and now on the Real Business Connections Network as well. Um, Cute's mission is simple, to awaken the spirit, uh, to awaken and inspire people across the planet to access inner freedom, live authentically, and fulfill their true life purpose. Cute, blessed to be here with you. Um, riff on your mission for a moment here. I want to hear it out of your, uh, in your words personally yeah it's really simple you know for me uh, my mission is to spread love on the planet to help people remember who they really are and uh that's that's in a nutshell you know that we are whole perfect complete divine beings we are we are um you guys cute didn't know i was going to bring this up exactly but i want to tell you and this is a safe space for both of us um august 11th So just over two months from the moment we're recording this today, um, my brother and I found my mom in her bathtub. She had passed away. Um, We hadn't spoken to her in numerous days, and there was no doctor warning signs. There was no red flags. It just sort of happened one day, two days before she was playing words with friends with her friends on Facebook. And... When that happened, cute, I remember back and I wrote this down because I knew I was going to butcher it. I listened to you on a podcast probably like seven or eight years ago, 2014, 2015, around that time. And you said something of the likes of healing is applying love to the parts of you that are hurting. Healing is applying love to the parts of you that are hurting. 
And in that moment, it wasn't easy, but I realized that I couldn't bring my mother back, but I could apply love to myself, that I could apply love to everyone around me. And I only bring that up because I know you've been through a similar struggle in trauma and a need to surrender. And you don't have to dive right into it, but I want to give you the space. Tell us your story. Who is Q Blackson? And what was the reason and the motive and what is the power of surrender? Um, so I think there's, there's a few different questions in that question. There is. And so um, who am I? Um, I think that is the, the ultimate question that we all get to ask ourselves. And uh, look, I was born in Ghana, West Africa. My father's from Ghana. My mother's Japanese. I grew up in London and over the last 20 some years in Los Angeles, California, in the US. So I feel like I'm a citizen of the world from everywhere, from nowhere. Um, from a very young age, as a young boy, I felt a deep and profound calling to serve people. Uh, as a young boy, I was very empathetic. So I would feel people's pain. I would feel people's suffering uh, really deeply. And there was always a part of me that wanted to do something about it, to alleviate suffering in some way. I didn't know what that would look like. And so uh, one of the memories that really impacted my life the most was being a chubby kid and I was lost in the crowd, literally thousands of people. And I remember seeing a crippled woman crawling on the floor and she picks up the sand that this man walks on, wipes it on her face and stands up. Um, so week after week, I grew up seeing, we could see miracles, you know, blind people seeing and deaf people hearing and people standing up out of wheelchairs. And so I grew up in a kind of shall we say, unusual environment. Although for me, I didn't think anything unusual about it. I didn't think anything extraordinary about it. It was quite normal. It was quite ordinary. I thought this was everyone's life. And so week after week, I grew up seeing you know, people stand up, standing up out of wheelchairs. The same man who sent she picked up would look at uh, a person with crutches and say, why do you have these crutches? Throw your crutches away, you're healed. And so this man was my father. He was considered the miracle man, a miracle man of Africa. He was the spiritual teacher to kings and heads of states and presidents. And so he built 300 churches in Ghana, West Africa. He was a very mystical, spiritual um, figure, you know, so I was blessed to grow up in a very spiritual, metaphysical understanding. He had a huge church in London. And so when I was age eight, I started speaking in my father's churches uh thrown into the audience one day that's when my speaking career began when i was about 14 i was ordained as a minister and i was given the mandate to take over my father's spiritual organization and i was going to be the one that took it to the next level and his successor and all of a sudden it was announced uh, to my father's congregation unbeknownst to me and i'll never forget the day it was announced another pivotal moment in my life um Everyone was happy. Everyone was celebrating but me because for me, my heart sank. I knew and I felt the sense that this wasn't my path. This wasn't my soul's destiny. I felt a different calling. I felt, I felt something pulling me in a different direction, even though I didn't know what it was. And um, the truth is I was too afraid to speak my truth. I was too afraid to, to speak my truth, to tell him my truth, to tell him this wasn't my path, because my fear was, and I think as human beings, we allow fear to hijack us. We allow fear to stop us from being who we really are. The fear is, if I dare to be myself, if I dare to express my voice, if I dare to be who I really am, you won't love me. And I'm, my fear was I'm going to be alone. I'm going to be outcast. I'm going to lose my father's love. And so for several years, I said nothing, went along with it. But at the age of 18, I, I really hit another pivotal moment. Um, I think it was a moment of truth and perhaps uh, a first moment where I had to truly surrender, even though I didn't know that's what I was doing. Um, I looked into my future and I realized I had some choices to make. And I think life is a series of choices and certain choices can shift the course of our destiny. And as I looked into my future, I felt my soul was calling me to to go in a different direction. I felt called to come to America, specifically Southern California, specifically Los Angeles, because as a young boy, I became obsessed with self-help books. From the age of eight to 18, I probably read 
seven, eight hundred self-help books in the field of psychology and spirituality and personal personal development and Eastern mysticism, Western mysticism. And it just happened that all of the uh, the living sort of self-development authors lived in Southern California. And so I wanted to come and meet these people. And so mm -hmm. my soul was guiding me and nudging me to come to, to the US. Uh, sometimes I think what your soul guides you to do doesn't always make sense to your mind or your logic. Uh, but I really believe that if, we, if you follow your soul, and you don't compromise your truth, that you will always be guided in the right place with the right people doing the right thing, even though the route that you take may not be the one that you most expect. And so I felt this strong mm. nudging to come to the US. It was, it was undeniable. It was beyond me. And yet, uh, and sometimes what your soul guides you to do is, isn't convenient as well. And, <laughs> and so uh, many times it's not convenient, actually. And, and, and so I felt this other... Pull, you know, the, the pressure of society, the pressure and expectations of my community and my father. And when I looked into my future, I projected age 20, age 30, age 40, age 50. And as I projected into my future, I felt such a pain. I felt a sense of profound soul suicide. I felt this deep heartbreak inside, like I was betraying my soul. And the pain was so deep that um, I knew what I had to do. I realized if I begin living a lie now to get the love that I th think I want from my father, I'm going to have to live this life for the rest of my life. And that self-betrayal, that soul betrayal was so painful. And so I decided to have the conversation. I decided to follow my truth. I decided to speak my truth. I decided to basically renounce everything, leave everything behind uh, and follow my soul. And I've been having a conversation with my father, which was terrifying and kind of long story short, I ended up having that conversation, which was very difficult um, because I also realized that you can't be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. And you can't be truly fulfilled and happy living someone else's life. And that there's no shortage of people that will think they know what is best for your life and your evolution and, 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 and will have so much advice for you. But the truth is, I think our soul knows. And so for me, life has been a continual process of surrendering to my soul at deeper levels. And so uh, long story short, I ended up winning a green card in the green card lottery. That's what brought me to the US. That for me was a confirmation that I was on the right path. And I came to the US with $800, uh, two suitcases, showed up in Los Angeles, began following, uh, following my soul, following a dream. When I found many of the mentors and teachers and authors I'd read about, the Jack Canfields of the world, Jack Canfield, Marianne Williams, and Deepak Chopra, went and found some of them, learned from some of them, went to their seminars. And I think a few years later, I got to a point where I was guided to travel and I ended up going to, basically, I got to the point where I was tired of reading books and mm -hmm. gathering information and I wanted to know truth for myself. And so I ended up going to uh, walking the Camino in northern Spain, 900 kilometers. I ended up going to Thailand, studying with some monks. I ended up going to Israel, following the, the footsteps of Jesus. I ended up in India, where I think all roads, spiritual roads seem to lead to India. And I ended up in India for three to four months and had certain profound experiences there. And that's what brought me back to LA. And uh, that's what inspired me to start working one-on-one -on -one with people. 20 years ago, it was one-on-one -on -one and that group, people came from around the world one by one, and it just evolved from one-on-one, one-on-five, one-on-20, one-on-500, and it just it just kept evolving to, to this point today. So that's the short version of, of my story. Yes, yes. And we're going to continue to what you're doing today, but Clarity Point, how do you define your soul? It doesn't have to be a perfect uh, definition, but uh, when you speak of soul, what are you speaking of? Yeah, to me, the soul is the real essence, the real essence of what we are, that individualized spark of the divine that is manifesting. Uh, it's that individualized spark of, of the essence of life that manifests itself, you know, in this form. And so to me, the soul is, is, is the essence of God that we all are, that we are all connected to, you know, to me at that level, we're one. 
the the essence we're all connected to. And yeah. and within this twenty year journey of coaching, your first book was "You Are the One." Mm-hmm. Well, what was the inspiration behind that book? What was the process of actually getting in writing that? What was the the, the wh- why did your soul guide you into the direction of writing that that piece that book? Um, you know, I think from a very young age, I always wanted to write a book, and I thought I'd write many books. And by the time I wrote that book, I probably projected and thought I would have written many books. But the truth is. Um, I was guided to write a book maybe even five years before that. And I was offered a contract by a perhaps a very renowned self-help specific publisher. And I sat with the CEO and he said, Coop, I love what you're doing. Your work is incredible. It's very unique the way you work with people, your methodology. And I had a specific kind of idea of a, a book I wanted to write. And he said to me, he said, Coot, uh, we want to work with you, but we want you to write this kind of book. We want you to put your methodology, your, your, your coaching, I call it uncoaching, your uncoaching methodology into a book. And, talk, talk about that methodology and, real quick. And, and, and make it a step-by-step system. Yes. And uh, it just didn't resonate with me. It didn't resonate with my truth. And here it felt like I was having another opportunity of someone kind of thinking they 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 knew what was best for me. And everyone around me said, Coot, you're crazy. Take this opportunity. It's amazing. You can write this book and then do your own thing. But everything in my being was saying, no, everything in my being was not aligned with with what I was hearing. And so I decided to not do that. And I decided again, to follow my soul, to follow my nudging, to follow my inner wisdom. And I feel as though many times, uh, I think we're all being guided we're all being guided by a wisdom inside of us and innate intelligence, but often we don't listen to it. We're so busy that we're not in tune with it. We're so busy that we distract ourselves from it. We're so busy that, that we don't really hear the nudgings of, of our own soul. We don't really hear the nudgings and the wisdom that is deep inside of us. And so we end up looking outside of us for guidance, but end up misguided, you know? And so um, I was guided to not pursue this opportunity. And for five years, I said, you know, I'm just going to go out and build my career, build, impact people, transform lives, build my um, platform and just build and create and add value. And so for five years, 2010 to 2015, I just went out and, and really uh, impacted some people on the planet. And I think by 2015, there was a natural organic ripeness to who I was as a human my development, my evolution, my consciousness. And I think when something is ripe, life unfolds. You know, I think in so many ways we go chasing things outside rather than becoming the thing inside. And so I think in this, during this time, I became the person. And so the book became the natural evolution and extension of who I was in my consciousness. And I just, I was ripe. And based on that ripeness, in that uh, alignment, the you could say the universe and opportunities just began to arise, not because I was chasing it, uh, which I was before, not because I was chasing it or seeking it or looking for it or promoting it, but just out of the, the sort of reflection of my own consciousness, people showed up. People showed up and agents showed up and editors, all these opportunities started happening and then Cut a long story short, the first book unfolded and the book went into a bidding war. And next thing you knew, I was signed with Simon & Schuster and writing a book. And that was a a really beautiful unfolding. Um, But but I really feel it came from the readiness of my own consciousness and the readiness of my own being. And so that was was the key. And And I think people think in manifesting, you have to go make things happen, go create things, go chase things. I think... Really, in life, you don't get what you want. You don't even get what you pray about, visualize, but you get what you are. And so I think when we really look at our lives, if we're not creating or manifesting what we say we want, I think it's important that we can look at our lives and say, okay, what is life mirroring to me about myself? What is life mirroring to me about my own consciousness? What are the results in my life mirroring to me about who I am? And if I don't like what I see out there, if I shift myself in here, likely the projection uh, will shift in the world. And so 
uh, the book was a, the first book was a real, was a real blessing. You shift inside, you get who you are, what you are. I love this. So you publish your, your call to write this book, you publish, you click publish. I know it's not as simple as just clicking publish. You click publish. How do you feel at that moment? How do you feel after accomplishing that? After sending the book to the publisher? It's, it's officially done. It's been sent to the publisher. It's live. People can purchase it. Are, oh, you, there, there, are you elated? There, there, are you moving to the next uh, step? You, you tell me I've there, never published a book. So. Yeah, there's different things in there. So, so, sure. so um, yeah, what, I mean, look, it, without laboring on the entire process, because there was a whole process, clicking publish, um, I can't say I felt elated. Um, because, you know, in terms of publishing a book, publishing a book is like 10% of the whole situation. The, the rest of the situation is marketing the book. And that's a whole nother process that that's a whole nother process in terms of marketing the book and promoting the book and getting the book out there in the world. That's like literally 90, I think that's 90% of the publishing process, to be honest. And so, uh, for me, it was, it was more the journey. You know, the journey of I really believed in the message. I really believed in the content. I really believed in the the idea of the book. Like, for instance, my second book, The Magic of Surrender, uh, which you asked a bit about. Um, this was not the book I thought I was going to write. Uh, I had all sorts of ideas of the book I thought I should write the second time around. I had all sorts of ideas of the book I thought, again, would be a bestseller. My first book was a bestseller. So I thought, oh, I want my second book to be a bestseller. So I had all of these great ideas of the book I thought would be a bestseller, a book I thought publishers would want, book I thought my audience would want. And honestly, none of the, I, I brainstormed all of these ideas and none of those ideas really resonated in my soul. Mm -hmm. I could not honestly look at those ideas as brilliant as they were and say, that's it. It might be what I wanted it to be. It might be what I thought it should be. They were all clever and amazing ideas that maybe I'll do sometime. But I couldn't honestly, with integrity, look at those ideas and say, that is what is aligned. That is what I am called to do and called to write about. The only word that, I, that stood out from the, the whiteboard, I was brainstorming ideas, was the word, I, I wrote a bunch of ideas on the board. The only word that stood out for me was the word surrender. And that's when I knew that I was being called to write a book about surrender, although this was not the book I wanted to write because I, I was actually resisting it because I thought, God, mm -hmm. surrender. You know, there's so many misconceptions about surrender. And we hear the word, the word surrender and then we run away from this kind of idea of surrender. It's like going to the dentist. You know, you should go, but often we resist going. And so we all know we should surrender. We should surrender, but we don't. And we resist, which we can get into. And so I had to surrender to the book that was seeking to be written. And when I truly surrendered to the book about surrender that was seeking to be written, uh, everything unfolded. Things started flowing. The ideas started flowing. Inspiration began flowing. And then I really felt the sense, and this is, I think, how you know that this is the book you're meant to write. I felt the sense that I wasn't writing the book. I was just in service in a vessel to the message and the soul of the book that was seeking to be written, that the book had a soul of its own. And I was just a vehicle to bring it into manifestation. I was a servant to the message. And that alignment uh, was so real for me. That alignment was so, uh, what's the word, connected for me that uh, I knew I would have the energy and the stamina and you know, the, everything it took to be able to go out and speak about the book on surrender. And so I think, you know, in so many ways in our culture, we have a misconception about surrender. This idea that surrender is weak, surrender is passive, that surrender means giving up, that surrender means, you know, waving the white flag, being a doormat, lying down, being taken advantage of, that if you surrender, you won't manifest your goals, your dreams, your desires. You're going to be left behind. And I'm actually saying, no, let's reframe surrender uh, from something passive to something active. Let's reframe surrender. And like, what if in truly surrendering, if we understood what surrender was, what if you didn't get less in life, which is often what we're afraid of? What if you actually got more? 
more than you could actually imagine with your conscious intention, your conscious control, your conscious awareness, your conscious mind. Maybe not what you thought you were going to get, but what if you got more and what if the more was actually better beyond what you could even imagine? Because many times we are projecting goals, dreams, desires based on our conscious logic, conscious awareness, which is based on our conditioning, which is based on our past, which is based on our current capacity and lens to perceive and see. And so we don't realize in so many ways that we are limiting life. And so part of surrender is to take the limitations off of life. So in terms of surrender, surrender is a letting go of control, or I should say the idea or the illusion that we are in control, because in so many ways, we may not be as in control as we have thought we were. If you look at the last couple of years with COVID, if you look at so many things, we weren't as in control as we thought, you know? Yeah. And so uh, surrender is letting go of the perception of control. I think control is a master addiction. Surrender is letting go of trying to force and manipulate life to fit our limited idea of how we think it should be and how we think life should be and who we the idea of who we think we should be. And, and it's, it's really letting go of that. So in the letting go of that, not only do we take the limitations off of life, but in the letting go of that, we open ourselves. we we'll actually allow ourselves to be open, to be available to the infinite possibilities. You know, if you look at the truly great ones, Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, I'm going to even throw in people like Elon Musk. Then we have people like Mandela and uh, Martin Luther King and, you know, Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali, Bob Marley. At some point, all of these great ones, they surrendered themselves. They surrendered themselves to their soul. They surrendered themselves to their higher purpose. They surrendered themselves to a deeper mission. They surrendered themselves to life. And in that surrender, I think they were able to transcend their own human limitations. And in that surrender, they tapped into another dimension of their own potential. And that's when life was able to flow through them and use them in ways that perhaps I think they were probably surprised in certain ways, you know? And so I think surrender is the most powerful thing that we can do as human beings. I really think that surrender is the password to freedom. It's the key to the next level. It's the key to true manifestation. And so I think we all want more magic. To me, the, the book is called The Magic of Surrender. We all want more magic, mm. but we don't want to surrender. And the formula for more magic, when I say magic, I'm talking about more abundance, more joy, that next level stuff, right? Mm. We all want, and when I say who wants more magic, everybody wants more magic, but very few of us want to surrender. And so the next level of your life, our lives, the next level, requires the next level of who we are. The next level of who we are requires that we let go of who we've been, requires mm. that we let go of what is no longer a vibrational match, what is no longer aligned. But as human beings, in many ways, what we tend to do is hold on to the old, hold on to what we know, hold on to who we've been out of familiarity, out of comfort, out of safety, out of self-protection, you know, out of ego preservation in certain ways uh, to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe. And, and so uh, we resist. And so I think true surrender, when we understand the power of it, true surrender is openness. True surrender is availability. True, sur true surrender is the willingness to allow life to guide us, life to show us, life to lead us. And, uh, you know, the old paradigm, and I think we are right now in the midst of a phase transition on planet Earth. I think right now we are in the midst of a, shift in consciousness, the entire shift as a humanity in how we are being invited to live life. The old way of living or the old way of manifesting, the old way of creating is that uh, is the sort of ego-based model for creating life, which is all about what do you want? What do you want? Get clear on what you want. Get specific. Get clarity. What do you want? But we don't ask the question you ask, well, who, 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 are, who am I? And who is the I that wants? And so many times from the old model of manifesting, you might manifest a goal, you might achieve it, only to realize hmm, it's not what I really wanted. It's just what I thought I wanted based on who I thought I was. 
And now that I've achieved it, it's not really what I truly want because often unconsciously our goals are sometimes projections of unmet needs from childhood. Like dad mm-hmm. wasn't around, I was bullied, I wasn't loved, I was called not enough, I was called not beautiful, I was called this, I was told I'd never make it. So now if I can just mm-hmm. get the house, the Lamborghini, the car, the Grammys, the fame, the blood, whatever it is, then I'm going to be enough. And the truth is nothing outside of ourselves fulfills us if we don't feel that inside. And so there is a limitation to the, the old way of living and creating, which is based on the ego paradigm. Right. And so that asks, what do I want? To me, as we make a shift, and I really think the last couple of years with a pandemic or COVID or whatever we want to call the last few years, I think the shift that's been happening in the last few years is the evolutionary invitation of the universe that has been breaking us down, breaking us open, and forcing us as a humanity to freaking surrender. We've been in a two and a half, two years surrender seminar as a global <laughs> humanity being forced to surrender to the unknown and what's going to happen and realizing we're in control and lockdowns and da, da, da. And, and so I feel we've been, it would be initiated into a new way of living that is really much more in harmony. Uh, uh, a death of our egos, death of who we thought we were, death of our identities to being initiated to a way of living that is much more in harmony with life, in harmony with the universe, in harmony with our souls, which is the question, there's a different question. And a different question is not, what do I want? The question that we start asking ourselves as we live a path of surrender is more about what is it that, what is it that life is seeking to express through me? What is it that the universe is seeking to manifest through me? What is it that the universe is seeking to live through me, create through me, podcast through me, write through me. And, and, and it's really about aligning ourselves with the deepest, most authentic impulse of our being so that we can feel the deep movement, the deep authentic movement that is beyond the ego, but from the depth of our souls. And then kind of catching that vision and aligning ourselves with that. And once we kind of feel the, the authentic goal, the authentic vision, the authentic expression of what is seeking to manifest, then we can align ourselves, align our minds, thinking, goal setting, resources, money, strategy with what's true and authentic and go 100% in that direction. And so surrender doesn't mean, mm. you know, sitting there doing nothing. It means aligning with what's true aligning with what's authentic rather than just kind of one's conditioning or wounds or programming, right? Aligning with what's true. And then as you align with what's true and authentic, you're in flow. Then you give 100% and and, and give everything you've got. And it's really about giving 100% as you move into action without attachment, just to clarify for people. So surrender isn't just sit there and do nothing. It's once you align with what's true, you give 100% to it but let go of the attachment. So that's, that's a bit about surrender and, and, the, and the second book. Align with what's true. I'm asking myself, who am I? How can I be a vessel yeah. to, to live in alignment with that truth and, and create a you know, collective impact in this world? COVID's a funny thing. I've joked on the side that no one wrote a handbook on how to handle a pandemic like this. Now, I would say no one really had a handbook on how to surrender. It sounds like you were, <laughs> you were called to write that handbook on surrender. Um, I resist. Uh, another thing that's coming to mind, I, I forget who said it. So if I remember, I'll put it in the show notes. He was talking about how you can't have the tens without the ones. And a lot of us are living a life of fours and five and six and seven, and it's eight on a good day and it's three on a bad day, hmm. but we can't have the tens in life. <clears throat> we can't have the highest of the highs without surrendering to the lowest of lows. You cannot have the high without st- going through the ones at times. I'm wondering if that resonates with you. And if so, I mean, what are some of the ones that you have went through in your life and how have they prepared you to better be a vessel for the tense? Yeah, look, I think that in life there is no perfection. And um, 
part of the surrender and part of the freedom in life comes not from life being perfect or there not being challenges, but in understanding the nature of life. When you understand the nature of life, come into acceptance and surrender of the nature of this reality, you're free. But it's a freedom that is not dependent on what happens out here. It's a freedom that is not dependent on life being a 10 or life being a one, mm. on it being sunny or it being rainy. It's an inner freedom. But most of us, our freedom is determined by the day being a 10 or the day being a one or not. And so when you understand the nature of life and the nature of reality, you're free. And part of that is to understand that in this dimension, this physical world is a world of duality. It's just the way it is. Duality. There's up and down, black and white, male and female, good and bad, positive, negative, right? Rich and poor, light and dark. It's physics, you know? It, it, it's, it, it, it's just the nature of this dimension. And I think when we can understand the, the interdependent polaric nature that we live in a world of interdependent polaric opposites, right? In this, this realm, then we stop fighting that. Mm. Then we stop looking to make it perfect or looking to make it any other way. It's, it's physics. It's the dance of life. It's the Tao. It's, it's the yin yang. It's the Tao. And so I think when we can really make peace with that, then we don't look for perfection out in the world. We don't look for life to be perfect in any way. We understand that life is expansion and contraction. Life is 10 and life is one and everything in between. Life is good. Life is bad. Life is positive, like negative. There will always be the plus and minus interplay of the interdependent polaric opposites in life. When we can just embrace that fully, mm. then we're no longer resisting life. So that when there's a 10, we're not holding on to that 10. Like, oh, i got to keep this 10 forever because we understand that life doesn't, doesn't operate that way. Life is transitory. One day it might, might be a 10 and one day maybe a 1. That doesn't mean we can't do things to perhaps, you know, live our best life, but, it, but we stop trying to attach to making all of life a 10 every single second. And then when life is a 10, we're like, I never want to lose this moment because the more we attach to keeping that a 10, the more contracted we end up getting, uh, the more we start losing that moment. And same, similarly with when things are a one or we feel challenged or we're going through difficult moments or challenging moments or heartbreak, you know, many times we resist the feeling, we resist those moments, we try to get rid of that bad experience, bad feeling, bad emotion, not never wanting to feel that again. But the more we resist it, the less we feel it, the less we feel it, the more we keep it stuck, and the longer it stays. And so when we can embrace the nature of life, and we and start realizing we are not the 10 or we are not the one. We are not the expansion and we are not the contraction. We are not the negativity and we are not the posit positivity. What we are really is, is so much more, you know? And I think there's a really profound freedom that happens when we can embrace life as it is and surrender to that and stop looking for perfection in the world. Stop. It, it, it's like I tell people, stop praying for the waves of the ocean to get easier. Instead, develop yourself. When you understand the nature of it, you start developing yourself, developing your mental, emotional, psychological muscle to be able to surf bigger waves. So in a mm. sense, we have no control. We don't have any control of the ocean. Zero. I mean, maybe some people will, oh, I'm going to go to the ocean. I'm going to visualize. It's bullshit. We have no control over the ocean. But that doesn't mean you go to the ocean and just drown. Right. If you look at the great big wave surfers like Laird Hamilton and Kelly Slater, they've cultivated and trained themselves to be able to, through practice, surf bigger and bigger waves. So the control we do have is, is, is how we train our mental, emotional capacity to, to surf bigger waves of life. And I think that's what we can do. Um, and, and if you look at the big wave surfers, the better they get, 
they don't look for one one waves. Hmm. The better they get, they look for the 10 waves. <laughs> you know, they look for the challenging waves. They look for, so I think if we can shift our relationship with life, then we start freeing ourselves. Because as we evolve and as our consciousness expands, the difficulties and the challenges of life will also expand to meet us in our level of consciousness. That's not bad. That's just evolution. That's not that we're doing something wrong. It's just that we've expanded. And because we've expanded, life is expanding with us. And so I would just say if you're facing challenges, congratulations. <laughs> you know, congratulations. And so, look, I've been challenged many moments of my life. I mean, I could bore you with another 14 hours of, of stories I and mean, many, many, many challenges. Um, but at this stage, I have learned to, you know, the, the way I see life, and this is really what's helped me regardless of the specific challenge. If you look at life one dimensionally, like oh, this difficult situation is happening, then many times we're caught up in the story, we're caught up in the one dimensionality, and we're stuck in, well, why is this happening to me? Which sometimes can move us into a powerless or victim experience or position. But I believe that we are souls. We are souls that we all incarnate into this human experience. We're here. That's proof. We're here. And we incarnate into this human experience. Uh, because perhaps there's lessons that we are here to learn. And so to me, life is a school. Life is a university mm. for our soul's evolution. And if that's the case, life is a university for our soul's evolution. Every experience, every relationship, every challenge, every, everything we go through is part of the curriculum for our soul's evolution. And so there's, there's, we're never not in an evolutionary process. Life is an evolutionary process. And so if we start seeing life as a school and, and, and a university for our soul's evolution, then every moment becomes an opportunity to evolve. And so then as difficult experiences arise, challenging, heartbreak, difficult things, death, you know, betrayal, it gives us a different relationship and perspective to go through it with a different insight. Because then it becomes, wow, not like, why did this happen to me? But why did my soul attract this experience? And what, what is it that my soul is seeking to learn in this situation? It's, it's screwed up. It's difficult. It's challenging. But what is my soul seeking to learn? And what is the classroom? What is the lesson? Because I think that if in any situation, if we're able to learn the lesson, we evolve. If we're able to learn the lesson, then we also transcend that experience and graduate to the next level of experience as well. And so I think when we can see life as an evolutionary invitation each moment, it can transform how you go through the ones and the difficult experiences, no matter how heartbreaking, because it gives you a whole different multidimensional relationship of life. So I'm good enough now. I'm consistently evolving there's an evolution as long as I'm open to it. I'm wondering because I want to get super tangible for a quick moment for the very rational, rational types. Sure. I'm in the classroom. I'm learning. I want to be the best surfer on <laughs> earth. Um, I understand what I need to do. Are there micro actions? Okay, Are here's one steps? thing. Here's yes, one step that people can take. Please. You know, first, it's, it's, it's shift the perspective, right? But mm. because that perspective allows you to go through life, looking at life through a different lens. Like, oh, okay. I mean, you start looking for the lesson. So that's one. But the other place I think that people can start as a very, mm, let's say, practical or simple, tangible place to begin is I think one of the things that keeps us from evolving and one of the things that keeps us stuck are all the ways we lie to ourselves. As human beings, we are constantly lying and bullshitting ourselves and rationalizing why we are the way we are and why we're not doing what we want to do. And we're, we're, we lie to ourselves as human beings. It's self-preservation. It's, it's, it's the ego self-protective mechanism for survival. And 
we stay in relationships that we know are not aligned. We work jobs that we know are not aligned and we wonder why we're not happy. And so there is no real transformation without truth. There is no real transformation without truth. It, it, it's like if all anybody did was you began to tell the truth to yourself about who you are, what you feel, and what you want, and you begin, began to tell yourself the radical, the raw truth, life would transform. To me, happiness is simple. Tell the truth, feel the truth, acknowledge the truth, speak the truth, live the truth. Happy life. But because of our own conditioning and our own survival mechanisms mm. to avoid pain and not feel and get love, validation, and approval, and have people love us, we've learned from childhood to like deny what we feel and pretend that we are who we think other people want us to be and mommy and daddy so that we can get love and validation. So we've been conditioned unconsciously to lie. And then we wonder like, why the hell am I not happy? <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, I think what that looks like is maybe asking yourself a question, but we have to be willing to be radically honest. You have to want the truth more than you want what you have. You have to want the truth more than you want what you think you want. And so that first question is a very basic question. What lies am I telling myself? End of story. What lies am I telling myself? Mm. It might sound like, you know what? I'm no longer in love after 10 years. That can be a very scary thing when we've invested so much. That can be a very scary thing when society deems us a certain way, when our entire identity is wrapped up in a certain way of living and perceiving. That can, it sounds easy, but it can be terrifying. So it takes tremendous courage to speak the truth. So, what lies am I telling myself? Wow, I'm no longer in love. Be with that. I hate my job. It can be scary because then it's like, well, if I tell myself the truth, you know, one of the reasons that we often don't tell ourselves the truth is because we're afraid of the consequences. And so we pretend, we justify, we, you know, we often play this game of confusion. Like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I, I don't really know. I don't really know what my life purpose is. When deep down, we freaking know what our life purpose is. We're just afraid to acknowledge what our life purpose is because if we actually acknowledge what our life purpose is, we might actually have to do something about it. So many times it's, it's easier to stay in a, I don't know, confusion facade because then we don't have to like put ourselves out there mm -hmm. and take the risk and risk who we are and what we have. And so- what lies am I telling myself? What I would also invite people is take the pressure off of yourself from having to take any action. Sometimes that pressure or fear of having to take action immediately is what clouds and blocks us into this smoke screen of confusion. So that might mean, you know what? I don't have to do anything. I don't have to take action, but I'm going to just acknowledge I'm not in love anymore. You don't have to leave. You don't have to break up. You don't have to do anything, but just let the truth start marinating inside. It might take you a year or two or three, but it's better than a lifetime. But if you just start telling the truth and letting that marinate, that begins a transformational process inside. I hate my job. Breathe that in. Let that sink in for a moment. You don't have to leave. You don't have to, because, because the thought of the consequence of that is often what blocks our willingness to tell ourselves the truth. It's survival. It's egoic survival. The ego's job is to, the, the ego's, is a whole nother conversation, but the ego's job is to uh, preserve and reinforce our sense of existing and identity. And the ego's job is to prevent us from getting hurt like we were hurt when we were young. It's a protective mechanism. And so one of the ways we protect ourselves is to live in denial or a lie. And so what lies am I telling myself? What am I pretending to not know? And also sitting with what are the lies that I'm telling myself costing me? And to let yourself feel the pain. Feel it. Many times how we keep ourselves stuck from getting in touch with the truth is we feel some pain. Pain might manifest in Depression, lethargy, tiredness, unhappiness, right? Frustration, resentment, physical pain, backache, shoulder ache, neck ache, dis ease, right? We feel pain. But what we tend to do as human beings, especially in our culture today, is we distract ourselves from it. We deny it. 
we drink it away, sex it away, smoke it away, uh, uh, porn it away, shop it away, social media it away, whatever it is, so that we don't have to actually feel the pain and feel the truth that's underneath that. I tell people that pain is a gift. Pain is a messenger. Pain is your friend. We must learn to pay attention to the pain and embrace the message of the pain because often by acknowledging the pain, the pain is a portal to a deeper level of our truth. It's trying to get our attention. It's trying to get our attention. So when we can just sit with the pain, not wallow in it, sit with it and ask ourselves, what is this pain trying to tell me? And acknowledge that. Then we can start moving in the direction of truth. And through moving in the direction of truth, we can begin to transform our life. If all someone did was started to tell themselves the real, raw truth in living that, life would transform. In fact, many of the things we visualize about, pray about, go to therapy about, you know, go to temple and pray to God and ask for help about, go to our shaman to ask for some special, you know, magic for, would dissolve. Mm -hmm. if we started telling ourselves the truth. To me, truth is real spirituality. Truth is real yoga. Truth is real spiritual practice. Truth is real prayer. And the truth will set us free. It will. Cute. I wish we could do another one of these. Maybe we'll, I'm going to have you back on if you come back. How do sure. I support you, me and all the listeners? How do we get more cute and, and uh. really just support you on your mission here? Awesome, man. A uh, couple of ways. Look, the book, The Magic of Surrender, is out. It's on paperback, and uh, I wrote it with a tremendous amount of love, and it's packed full of, yeah, it's a, it's a handbook for how to surrender and written for the modern times. And so The Magic of Surrender, available on Amazon, the paperback version. Check it out there. Uh, my main website, Coot Blackson, K-U-T-E, Blackson, CootBlackson.com. Uh, find out some info there about my work. Uh, twice a year, I do an event to Bali. If people feel a calling to go to that next level of their life and you know transform their past and connect to their true power and kind of catapult themselves forward to living your true soul's destiny, um, you can find out more, www.boundlessblissbali.com every July and December. What's beautiful is podcast listeners know that'll be in the show notes. Um, gang, we didn't have time for the full rapid fire round, but I do want to ask you one rapid fire sure, question because sure, sure. it's my favorite one. The 30 second answer. I know we could go all day on just this. <laughs> Cute. Who is your hero and why do you choose who you choose? Who's my hero? That might be the most difficult question. What's funny with the rapid uh, fire round is we usually do quick, short, sweet ones, and then I weave in the heavier ones, but I went straight for the heavy one. <laughs> who, who uh, you know, it doesn't have to be your one hero. Yeah, but. you know, you know, for me, my mother is a hero for me. And then yeah. she's the one that inspired the book, The Magic of Surrender, to be honest. Um, my mother is a hero. I, I, I'll share a quick story, if that's cool. Um, because my mother was diagnosed with stomach cancer. In 2016, I got to spend a year with her. I was flying back from LA to London every month to be with her in a chemo sessions. And the reason she's my hero is because um, when the doctor said about six months into the process, basically, there's nothing we can do for you. So get your affairs in order. Basically, you're going to die, you know. And I'm glad I got to be with her. I had a year with her. I'm blessed that I had a year with her. Um, I looked my mother in the eyes and I said, two questions. The first one, are you afraid? And she looked at me. This, my mother's a little, little Japanese woman. And she looks me in the eyes and she says, I'm not afraid because I know I'm not this body. And this body will die, but I will not. And I will be with you, guiding you from the other side. And she looked me in the eyes with such peace. You know, no, no, eh, no cameras around, no YouTube, no. It was just me and her. And she, I could tell she knew. And she just looked me in the eyes with such peace. And she says, I'll be with you. I'm not dying. And I felt that transmission of her knowing. And I looked her in the eyes and I said, what, what can I do as your son to make your final days easier? Well, like, 
what do you need? What do you want? Where do you want to travel? Like, what can I do? And she said to me, there's nothing I want. There's nothing I need. All I want is what God wants for my life. And in that moment, I understood why she was free. I understood why she was at peace this whole time. This whole time she didn't cry. She didn't complain. She was truly, truly at peace, smiling and happy because she was surrendered. She wasn't attached to living. She wasn't attached to dying. She was just open to the unfolding of life, however it unfolded for her. And that was the source of her peace. And so I think in so many ways, uh, she exemplified that and live that in her life. And uh, I would say that's why she's, she's a hero of mine because she, even from the other side, even while her physical form is not, got, is not here, I still feel her soul and her spirit inspiring me to live that surrender more and more. Thank you for coming on, Q. Thank you for sharing that. If you'll come back, you will be back on the show in the near future. Sure. God bless you and we'll talk soon. Thanks again for listening to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. You need to go subscribe if you haven't yet. This show is completely free. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right. Thanks once more for listening to LST. I am so grateful. Talk to you soon.